welcome back to another featured practice owner segment on the Private Practice Growth Club YouTube channel. Welcome back, and I would love to introduce my amazing guest, Audrey Geyer, who is an, an occupational therapist and life coach based in Cape Town. I'm so excited to introduce Audrey to you. I think we're going to learn so much from her. So welcome, Audrey, and thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for the invitation, and I'm so excited to be here with you today and um, to speak to all your followers. Yes, I've been following you for a while, and I've, as you know, I, we've been wanting to do this interview for so long, but you know, the internet gremlins kept coming in our way, so I'm glad we finally managed to set this up. So I think let's start off with you just telling us a little bit about yourself, your journey into occupational therapy, and how you landed up where you are today. Yes, yeah, so I qualified from the from Turkey's um, Pretoria in 1998, and um, I think what I would just say about OT is I love being an occupational therapist. I've always loved it. I think I was one of those people that were really blessed to have just picked the right career from the beginning, and I think just being 45 and having gotten to know myself really well, I think. The part that I love is the human behavior. It's the understanding why we do what we do. I also have a very deep drive towards, I think, learning and applying and teaching self-mastery skills from a very practical perspective. And I feel OT answers to that. I don't want to know the miracle is in tomorrow. I want to understand practically what is the process and the steps that gets me there. And that's what I love about occupational therapy. It's, it is about the practical implication that empowers the patient. And I think my whole background, even being a life coach today, my whole background as an OT is the foundation on which I function. I love the fact that we're so good at observation, so good at analyzing. We can really see and listen with our whole body and understand where a client is at and then use our knowledge to know where a client needs to go. And I think that is the foundation, basically, from OT transitioning into life coaching. Um, I have worked in all the areas of occupational therapy, um, literally beads. And then I was um, in the UK for six years where I had the opportunity to locum in geriatrics and orthopedics and community and acute hospital settings. Um, came back, did a lot of medical legal work. And from a business perspective, I've been the sole pr proprietor. I employed a big team of about nine OTs at one point and two or three admin staff. I have gone from that into partnership with someone and I've gone to dissolving all of that and starting my life coach business um, in 2020 um, and sort of working on it, building it up from scratch again. So I do have, I'm quite I have a lot of background in business, in money, um, from a health professional's perspective uh, with this interest of human behavior. That's amazing. And I think um, I really resonate with your journey of being a bit of a comedian OT. Um, that kind of has had been my journey as well. And I also found that despite having been in physical, in neuro, in peds, in learning difficulties, um, that mental health and human behavior is where I, where I really feel passionate. Mm -hmm. Like I can talk on hours <laughs> about yes. those topics. And, and, and like I said to you before the interview began, like um, I'm very familiar with the life coach model training that you did because mm -hmm. it's something that I always wanted to do as well um, because I'm so, I, I have got um, some training in cognitive behavioral therapy. And of mm -hmm. course, that's not in our scope of practice. So it was amazing to find kind of a modality where we can apply some of that without actually working outside our scope. Um, but then I'm very interested to hear a little bit more about your business experience, because it sounds like you've had quite a, a range of experience in the different types of practice models. You've had some experience in the minefield that is employing other people and having a partnership relationship. Um, you can choose what aspects you, you feel you'd like to share that is that you feel has been the biggest learning for you. But of all of those experience, can you share to those practice owners who are entering in the space, what are some of your biggest learnings across that journey that you've had? I think the biggest thing that I would say is 
doesn't matter sort of which rugby felt field I walked on to be it a sole proprietor employing people or not looking back it's dealing with myself it's with every change and every growth and every new thing I I take on comes my mind drama my overwhelm my fear my anxiety and watching my brain and myself over the years I have it's amazing I'm doing new studies now and every chapter every single chapter my brain goes into an overwhelm and a drama and I, I will never be able to learn this. And it's just so hard and all the reasons why I shouldn't and can't do it until I've studied the chapter. And then it's like, oh, but that was easy. And then I go to the <laughs> next chapter, right? And I, looking back, I have enjoyed all the different modalities. I've, I loved working on my own. I loved growing a business. I loved being in partnership. And I also love having come out of that partnership. Um, really looking back, it's been my willingness and my openness to seize what is in that moment and to lean into doing the hard things, into driving through the overwhelm, into learning what I need to learn from a practical and technical perspective, and being okay with the fact that not everything in each phase I have to love. Everything mm -hmm. Every, every, um, every part of that came with a part that I loved and a part that I hated, a part that was really good and a part that I would never want to do again. And I think for me, I just see the life like that. I, I understand that doesn't matter what I choose. Part of it is going to be amazing and part of it is going to challenge me. And that's just normal. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, but, but I don't think I would pick one. I, I think there is a pros and cons to both and you need to to all the different ways and you need to embrace that. It is definitely interesting working with people. What, what has been hard, I think, through the, the COVID phase specifically, I was just very aware how, how employees and staff, um, my sense of the dependency of people on me and the responsibility I felt um, in carrying that. Yeah. That was quite, that's maybe my most recent growth has just been how, and again, it's not, it's neutral. If you have stuff, it, you know, that's, that, that looks to you, but my response to that and how I reacted to that was, was quite interesting. Like you said, the mind feel of employing people is interesting and, and finding that balance, that model where you give people enough responsibility to actually step up for themselves compared to you micromanaging. I, I had a lot of learning in that. I love that um, the themes around your learnings is really much about your own mindset mm -hmm. and development, which I really love because, you know, you mentioned you have to be willing to learn the technical, mm -hmm. practical stuff. But what mm -hmm. I'm finding is that most health professionals tend to focus on that part. Like, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, they want to know, go to do the webinars on like mm -hmm. um, how to name your practice, how to market, how to all of those. Those are all the technical tactics and mm -hmm. applications mm -hmm. of running a practice. And that is why in the Private Practice Growth Academy, the first module before we get into any of the practical mm -hmm. stuff is actually mindset and manifestations. Mm -hmm. It's looking at, well, how, what do you need to do in your own self? Like, how do you need to develop your own mindset? And imposter syndrome is a huge thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, no matter how, I mean, I've got more than 20 years ex clinical experience, but still with my practice, I still feel like, oh, do I know what I'm doing? Like, maybe I don't really know what I'm doing and I'm just kidding myself and somebody's going to find out that I'm like faking it this whole time. Um, it's a real thing that you have to deal with then in private practice as well, because then you're going to think, oh, like, I don't know what I'm doing in business. And you tend to like hide from the difficult stuff. Like you said, like most people will say, like most people tell me, oh, but I'm so technical, technologically unsavvy. That is a lie that you tell yourself because it's uncomfortable to get to learn these things. The fact that you can use your cell phone when they weren't cell phones that not too long ago mm -hmm. means that you're not technologically unsavvy. Mm -hmm. You can operate your cell phone yes. in your sleep. You know, so I think that I love that you mentioned that that were, a lot of it was looking internally and being aware that there are going to be things that you need to do in your business that you don't enjoy. And sometimes you can, you know, outsource that or, or things like that. But at the end of the day, you need to still 
come to terms with it and get to know it and actually develop the skills where it's required. Mm -hmm. um, but I wanted to maybe touch on uh, through your, your span of experience, have they, are there any standout um, experiences for you where it was like a big learning moment, like either something went horribly wrong and you've learned from that going forward or something went unexpectedly so well that you didn't like think that that would go so well and so you've learned from that? Yeah, I want to almost just quickly respond to your first comment and then go on to answering this as well. Is, and this is maybe just already a tool for your listeners and your followers to use, but I very strongly believe that what you think creates your emotion. And if you feel excited, it drives a certain set of behavior that gets you your result. And if you feel overwhelmed, then your behavior looks different and it gets a different result. And a lot of people will tweak and work on their action line, the how to, how will I say it? How will I name it? How will I create it? How will I describe it? Not really understanding that well, how you think about learning this new technology, right? Will create, let's say it creates, you need to learn how to do a Facebook ad and it creates a lot of overwhelm for you you most likely are going to procrastinate or you are going to spend a lot of time trying to fix the picture to look perfect, thinking that <laughs> that will create the result that you want. Yeah. Where if, you, if you just come back to human behavior, how you think about Facebook ads will create neutrality or excitement and can drive behavior. The primitive brain at any start of a new goal, goal wants to know how. And mm. I, I want to offer this. How do you know to be, how to be an occupational therapist? When did you know? Only after you arrived. Mm. You didn't know how to do it. And then you did the studies. You had to do all the steps and at the end of it. It's like driving. When do you know how to drive? At the first lesson or after you've learned and then a youngster comes by and says, well, how do you drive? And you say, well, that's how I learn. So many mm -hmm. failures, so many stalls at a stop street, so many <laughs> um, trying to pull away. That's how. Yes. But yes. we don't know the how until we've done it. Yeah. But the brain, the primitive brain wants to know the how before we start. Because what if I fail? Yeah. What if I get rejected? What if I, I don't make it? What if I'm not valuable enough? And remember, the primitive brain always wants to call us back into, into the cave, right? It doesn't want us to do something new. And business is like the most scariest thing that you can do for the brain, right? Yeah. So, so sort of just already for your, for your listeners, where we get stuck, the imposter syndrome comes from being, I, I call it getting into your A-line, right? It's being so obsessed with the actions you need to take. Yes forgetting that the actions are driven and the behaviors are actually driven by your thoughts and, and yeah. by your beliefs. Yeah. So I think that probably the hardest thing in, I started my life coach practice. I, I literally left my OT job at the end of 2019. I, I still have sort of a tail end that I'm, I'm following through on OT, but to start the coaching practice. So I think what was the challenges that came from, letting go of the financial security that I've mm. built up, starting again with all the uncertainty of whether they will actually be success. Mm. And then I think probably from a practical perspective, the amount of technology that I had to learn to overcome. So how to be on a video, how to um, have a calendar scheduling system, <laughs> which now seems so e easy right yes. now that I can drive. It's like, oh, pulling away with the car is nothing. But in that yeah. moment, oh, my word. And um, how to fit together a pixel, a website with a calendar system, how to have a, a recording system that is high quality, all the technical stuff. I have some lights and a microphone and um, how to build a video course oh it, it it huge overwhelm that paralyzed me probably for about four months in the beginning of my career mm -hmm. and my brain was just there's no way that I can learn and 
I think with technologies, you just nail something and then there's a better, bigger <laughs> program out there, right? Yes. So that was that was a huge challenge for me. And I'm still learning, but I'm two years on and it, it doesn't feel as overwhelming. I've shown my brain enough times now that I can actually do it. Mm-hmm. Again, can you see it? It's only once we can drive that we can reflect that how easy it is. Didn't feel yeah. easy learning. Yeah. And then I think the other thing that I'm still working on that is still a huge challenge for me is um, marketing and selling. And for OTs, when I coach OTs on this, um, we have to, and again, a little tip for your, for your followers is we have to really believe in ourselves. I see it as a triad, a triangle, right? Believe in you, believe in your client and believe in your product. Mm. And there's a lot of mind work that we need to do because sometimes we have these thoughts about ourselves that maybe I'm not the best OT. There's so many mm. other experienced OTs there. Why would they choose me? And if you go in with that mindset, when you speak to a doctor or an attorney or whoever is your referral source, a school, even if that's not the words you say, that's the energy that you're going to carry over. Absolutely. And then interesting, when I work with um, OTs and I say, well, what is your belief about the attorney? What is your belief about the doctor? What is your belief about the school headmaster? Then we have a lot of judgmental thoughts about them. They're too stingy. They're hard to break through. through. They don't want to change. They're not really open to this. And it makes us feel self-doubt. It makes us feel um, inferior. It makes us feel confused. Yet we want to try and go and sell from that energy. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. And but that's still for me. I'm I am still learning in that area to clean up really all my thoughts on believing in human beings, right? Whoever they are on the other side of of your product, that that I can connect with the doctor I'm sitting in front of, connect with the attorney, connect with the school headmaster, connect with the parent, connect with the the actual client from a place of believing that they actually want what I have to offer Mm. and that they have the ability to grow and change and get the best out of this, as well as believing that I can deliver my product to anyone that stands in front of me. I really love this triangle that you spoke about because it just dawned on me that this is particularly an occupational therapy problem, I I find. Mm that like we're physios and speeches and that might also have self-doubt and maybe um, not so sure whether Mm. they can achieve the results for their clients. But when it comes to the product, which in our case is the profession, physios are 100% believe in their profession and what they do, speeches do as well. And I find occupational therapists, we tend to have a lot of of a big inferiority complex Mm because our profession is so holistic and so difficult to like pigeonhole um, that I find that perhaps that that is a big problem in why we struggle to market our services because we feel almost like inferior to a physio or to a psychologist or whoever provides an overlapping service because we can provide service in both psychological, physical and neurological and all of those things. And so combining that with our own self-doubt It's like that's a whole two, that's like a base of your triangle, basically. And so it's very difficult to, and and I think that is the thing, like, I mean, in the academy, when I teach about marketing or all these webinars, I always talk about how, like, you know, we tend to default to the tangible. We think that marketing is our logo and the pamphlets and the website. Mm -hmm. Those are only um, visual manifestations of our brand. It's not marketing in itself. Marketing is who are you speaking to and what are you trying to say what problem it is that you can solve. So what you're just saying now is really eye-opening because in effect it's saying that if you don't believe in uh, your profession as the product that you're offering and yourself as the ability to deliver that product effectively, then of course your marketing is going to be, I was going to swear now, I was going to be crap (laughs) because you aren't then communicating to this client what problem you can solve and how and in a believable way and an authentic yes. way. So I think that's really eye-opening. And again, it points to like this important mindset work that we need to do around, around that. Um, 
I wanted to also say that, like, I think um, when it comes to the tactics, um, you know, it's like that quote is Mandela that said, it's you, it's, it always seems impossible till it's done. You know, mm. it's that, it's the thing of um, sometimes, like, as you said, like, it's when you're doing one thing, it's one step at a time that mm -hmm. instead of focusing, um, and I'm reading this book called um, Atomic Habits by James Clear, where he talks about, it's like we focus on changing the speed, like the end result. Instead of focusing on the end result, that's that's kind of the direction you're going to, but instead yes. of focus on the, the small steps, and that mm -hmm. should be your goal. Each small yeah. step that takes you to the bigger thing is your goal rather mm -hmm. than the big thing at the end. And that gives you that sense of accomplishment. Okay, I've managed to now at least create a Facebook page. Mm -hmm. Yay me, like yes, <laughs> I feel absolutely. great. Now, what is yes. the next thing that I need to learn? And you build on, and it's the the... The kind of the the snowball effect of building on each each of those, and the the, the, the funny thing is, as OTs, that's what we do with our clients. We we know we have grading, we do it, these wonderful activity analysis that we are experts at, and we do it for our clients, and yet we don't apply the knowledge to ourselves, mm -hmm. which is very ironic. In coaching, how I word that is, I I teach my clients to constrain. Right. So I always see it like this. Yeah, you and I are today are standing on this side of the river and there's a gap, there's a river between our future selves, the person I want to be, the business I want to build, the amount of money I want to earn, the type of relationship I want to have. And then I see it as pebbles, right? We exactly what you're saying. We have to go from pebble to pebble and, and eventually one day we wake up and we have we we are just this future person. But what what happens for the brain and the definition of overwhelm is that you look across the river and you see the 12 or the 20 pebbles and it feels to the brain like you should do all of them right now. Mm -hmm. There's not time to take a year or three years to build a business. It feels like you should just know it all and do it all within the next three months. Yes. And interesting, it's like almost having a flat tire and then jumping out and slashing the other four, three as well, <laughs> rather than just taking the one thing, constraining to just learning how to open a Facebook page yes. or learning how to name your practice and almost telling your brain, I, I'm giving myself three years mm. because if you have six weeks, it feels overwhelming. But if you have a year to figure out Facebook ads and marketing, or you have a year to learn how to believe in yourself and how to believe in your client, then the brain is like, okay, I can do that. And then we come to constraining. Yeah. What, what is the one thing I want to focus on for the next 30 days? And I want to practice, practice, practice. And then at the end of the year, we've nailed 12 things really exactly. well. And the impact is permanent rather than trying to touch it all and really giving up because that's what yeah. the brain does when it goes into overwhelm. Absolutely. And that is why um, I recently held the 90-day launch plan workshop because what I was finding is even though, I mean, a lot of the information I talk about like in these marketing webinars, it, it is there in the booklets. Um, mm. But the overwhelm comes from, like you said, it's like too many things that you need to know and learn. And so the, the whole idea of that 90-day launch plan was therapists were feeling overwhelmed by all the things they need to do to open their practice um, because they were looking at that three-year goal of I want to have a practice with so many patients. So how do we break that down? Okay, let's only look at the next 90 days. Yes. What are the top goals that you need in terms of building your mindset, in terms of your money, uh, in terms of your marketing, and in terms of setting up operations? One goal in each thing and then have and then break that further down into the first 30 days next 30 days mm. and the last 30 days beautiful and then when you get to the end of that 90 days how do you then re-evaluate what worked and didn't work because it's also about taking away this whole fear of failure because people think oh well I said I'm going to do this in the next 90 days and if I don't do it then I'm a failure whereas if you take the approach of no it's a journey and at the end I'm going to review and say well I didn't completely fail because I made strides toward there. Yes. I just didn't go at a good enough pace. Yes. What can I change? What is my goal to be? How can I change what I'm going to do forward? And if you take that approach, then it doesn't feel like failure. It feels more mm. like you're on this journey right. and you're slowly mm. making strides forward. So uh, I think that, and, and and a lot of that is the, I had to learn that myself because I am like that. I'm a big picture thinker. I always have a lot of ideas. Um, and then I want to do all of the ideas and I don't know how to break it down. And I had to teach myself 
to really break things down and to the smallest mm. measurable mm. achievable mm. thing that I can do and focus on that so I think that's great and and I see that you do you do focus specifically um your life coaching you target specifically health professionals that's so great. tell us a little bit about um how you then made the transition to life coaching why you decided to focus specifically on health professional and what is the difference between therapy and life coaching hmm. so like i said i think i have a very deep-seated passion uh, my dream is to learn and teach and apply self-mastery and from my own journey of a lot of pain and discovering how to be whole and complete and how to really love myself and how to that really value myself I discovered how the this car drives the mind and the emotions and it's so powerful and so easy that it it was just it's it's so compelling that I can just not not share this information with people and I think for I've loved being an OT this was for me taking it deeper to the next level working with healthy individuals um, and, and teaching them. And I have a love for business, obviously, how to apply themselves. And in that, everything comes up. Uh, the, the brain, the, how it does one thing is how it does everything. So how you decide to eat only salad tomorrow and then give up for the donut is the same as how you decide to do a certain hard piece of project in your diary at 12 o'clock tomorrow, and then you give up for doing something easier. It's the same way how you decide to save your money and not impulse buy. And when you get there, you, you buy the item. So we can just focus on business or on money or on anything in your life. And if we nail that, the brain will automatically change the pattern in all the other areas. I love OT and I, therefore I love OTs. So a lot of health professionals that I coach is occupational therapists, physiotherapists, and interesting, their husbands and their sisters and their friends. OTs, I think I just love because I get what your day-to-day -day living looks like. I get, it doesn't matter at which stage, stage of business you are, I get that. And I think my clients often associate with me, like we're connected from understanding what their day-to-day -day potential struggles and actions are. And within that, people then coach on their marriages and their money mindsets and their breakdown relationships with their parents because it is also interconnected. Mm. So I just, I, I think it was for me, it was, I wanted to get a little bit out of the acute, and this is maybe the difference between therapy and life coaching is my clients are clients and not patients. So when a, a, a patient come, is in the middle of an injury, of pain, of being unfunctional, of still needing to process the trauma of the pain of the event, then that I see that as therapy. Life mm -hmm. coaching is now that you have processed it, and you have dealt with the past, from year on, you're saying to me, I would like to have a future focus and I want to move further than the trauma. Now, sometimes we still need to do some processing or something happens while we're coaching. And I'm very quick to refer a per person back to therapy if it's deeper than what we can process here. So life coaching is all about processing emotion, but it, it's future focused. It's focused on who do you want to be, become and how do you start deliberately thinking towards that person rather than having the past focus, borrowing from the past to tell you what you can achieve in the future. Mm -hmm. So typically for an OT, it would look like this. They've never opened a, a private practice or they've tried before and failed or they've never employed staff. So they're wanting to do something that they've never done before. And then they're looking to the past to tell them whether they can do it or not. But mm. obviously there's no information in the past because they have never done it. Yes. And the brain always will look at what it's done in the past to decide whether it can be efficient. So life coaching takes you from where you are now into the future focus and within that, sometimes 
what's holding you back is maybe a belief that you developed about money in your past or a belief that you have about connecting to people from the past or mm. a belief about yourself and your ability to do business. Mm. Therapy for me will be dealing with the event that has happened, be it from a psychological perspective or an OT or a physio uh, a perspective of strengthening a muscle, dealing with acute pain, dealing with the trauma, having the opportunity to tell your story of how hard it was and for someone to say, yes, that was horrible. That's not life coaching, right? But you do need an opportunity to, to say that and speak that and deal with that and feel that. Yeah. Right. So there's and, another... And, yeah. There's another overlap that I want to just also get your opinion on. And you've kind of alluded to that a little bit. Um, uh, we, you know, you spoke about the difference then between therapy and coaching, but there's this other aspect of the fact that as OTs, because we're so holistic and we, we can be classified as mental health professionals. I, there was another psychologist on Instagram who was, uh, she was more talking about people who are unqualified calling themselves therapists and mental health therapists and saying the only people they can call themselves are psychologists and things like that. And I said, no, actually, as occupational therapists, we can call ourselves um, health, uh, mental health therapists. But um, it becomes a little bit murky waters then in terms of what then is the difference? Because, I mean, inherently in occupational therapy, coaching is something we do. It's just not our main thing. We just yes. use it as a tool, right? within our therapeutic modality mm. but then what then is the difference or how do you see the difference between or when somebody uh, needs to come to occupational therapy for a mental health concern versus a life coach versus a more in-depth psychological intervention from like a clinical psychologist or a, or a registered counselor so for me let me answer that part first a, a, a registered counselor and a psychologist is the most important person when you have been through a trauma, you've been in an accident, you have gone through a divorce, you have just had an acute breakdown and meltdown from burnout, and you still need to actually have the opportunity to cry about it, talk about it, be the victim, right? You need an opportunity to just be the victim and and really feel the pain around it. I really believe that psychology is the most effective treatment there. And obviously OT works alongside, and that, those are the clients we see in our acute facilities when we are mental health OTs. And there's a role for OT to do life skills coaching um, and, and functional um, implications that goes alongside while you're dealing with this pain and, and, and maybe stabilizing even on medication at that point to teach you how to just get your head above water and just be able to be part of society again. Okay. There's, that, there's no life coaching in there. So an, an example of a client that was referred to me recently was a spinal injury client, was a girl of 23, and she was a new quadriplegic. And she was maybe three or four months on from her accident. And she needed an occupational therapist to help her function from a skills level in this new identity, mm. in this new body. And she was someone that I rather refer to occupational therapy for intervention. She was in pain, she was distraught, she wasn't coping, she didn't know how to, and I felt an OT would be beautiful to help her with the physical functional perspective, but also just the skill set that she needs, the life skills that she needs to implement. Mm. She would become a great candidate probably a couple of years from now for life coaching when she is she has acceptance of where she is. She's learned the physical and emotional functional skills to say, right, so what is my future? Who is it that I want to become going forward? Mm -hmm. I also had a client just as reference, always makes it easier. Again, a young girl, I think she was 28 and she was 
um, she has been struggling with depression and bipolar disorder her whole life, um, had fallen in and out of education and landed her job, a, a job in a pharmacy. And she was struggling to maintain her position there because she was dealing very frequently with her depressed mood and her mood swings and everything that, that went with that. She wasn't ready for a future focus. She was just ready for someone to help her stabilize and function where she was in that moment. Mm -hmm. For me, that's still in the clinical realm, realm of OT and psychology, and it's still acute. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, I can also give an example where it's not necessarily acute, acute, but it's um, where I worked at a, a, in a, um, a consumer led, they call consumer led project in the UK. So it's people with borderline personality disorders, basically, they used to be able to just self admit themselves to like the ward at the hospital, and the hospital wanted to get a get do away with that to encourage integration. So this was consumer led is, as in they did my interview. They were the ones who employed me. They ran the, the, the project. But there was one particular lady there who had severe social anxiety disorder. Mm. Um, and when I went to see her, because she often didn't come and think like that, I went to see her at her house. You know, it was, her house was dark. She So she mm. basically lived in this dark house and she would get into her truck, drive to the center, drive home, and she didn't go to the shops, none of those things. And... The o myself as the OT and the psychologist, we actually worked hand in hand with the psychologist doll did all the deep CBT stuff yeah. around her thoughts and around her anxiety, identifying signs of when she was having a panic attack mm -hmm. and, and, and giving her the, the mental tools yes. of what to use in the moment. Whereas mm -hmm. I as the OT physically drove to her house and did yes. the graded exposure by going yes. from a house, parking at the furthest spot, then going home, and then the next day yes. parking closer. And then in that moment, referring her back to her psychology sessions and how does she actually apply that mm. in the moment. Mm. And that's how we work together, um, where we were kind of working with the same thing, but where, where, the, where my role was more functional and actually yes. applying into real mm. life. Mm. Um, so, what, but what I want to now touch on is what I'm finding, you, I mean, you've beautifully explained the difference between psychology, OT, and then life coaching. It's like a spectrum, right? But what I'm finding, which is concerning, and which, which is why that psychologist I spoke about earlier did that post, um, is that there is a concerning um, um, increase in life coaching on social media that is almost bordering on talking psychology. So mm. all those things you mentioned about dealing with deep trauma and things like that, a lot of life coaches are talking about that as something that they provide. Mm. And these are oftentimes, unfortunately, the ones who do that are the ones who actually have like the six week certification or like, you know, the Udemy certification, the, the, the coaches who have lots of experience, who have been studying for long, who did like lots of practicals and all of that, they know where their boundaries lie. But the ones who don't really have the psychological background are the ones who are almost overstepping that boundary. So mm -hmm. what are your views on that? And how oh. can we as, you know, like health professionals I think, actually... I think the biggest thing for the listeners to understand is that the life coaching industry is not regulated at all. Anybody can do on Udemy a three-day cognitive behavioral therapy type coach training and just be a life coach. Hmm. And it doesn't mean that when someone says I'm a life coach, they actually have any experience to back up what they're about to do. So I think for the person interested in life coaching, that is the type of questions. That's why there should always be a, a consultation with a person to find out who you are, what's your background. The only people that really can um, or should be on, uh, on um, social media be saying, I can do the psychology and the life coaching should be a psychologist who also happens to offer life coaching. Hmm. I can talk to being an OT and a life coach. So I could can possibly from my experience say to my clients, listen, I can have some insight into your private practice and I can I, I can 
do coaching. I would have to just set a very good boundary because in life coaching, we don't tell people what to do. I don't get into your action line and say, well, I think you should do this and this and this. But certainly I want your, you to, to tap into your own brain and figure that out. But I can certainly, as a side note, having been there and having my experience, have a separate conversation about what I did and how I did it and, and my experience of that. But yes, I think there's a dangerous ground. I think wellness and life coaching is buzz words. And just to be aware that it's an industry that's not regulated and anybody with very little experience can just be a life coach. And I'm guessing it's those people that overstep the boundary, mm -hmm. not knowing better. And unfortunately, there isn't a regulating body that's going to pull that in or stop that. Mm, yeah. So that thing goes on to my last question that I wanted to touch on, what, which was that I'm so, uh, as far as I understand with you, you've um, stopped doing OT and you're now doing life coaching full time. But when there is a situation where you are both or you want to offer both um, and you've kind of alluded to that in terms of setting very clear boundaries and also I know that in our professions council code of ethics they do talk about how you know you can't um, although they're talking about dual practice like people are duly registered as their OT and a physio or speech and so on that you, you know there's there's some legalities around self-referral and I know with Brooke Castillo, I know I listened to that podcast where she spoke to some um, psychologists who are also life coaches and they had an extensive discussion around like, you know, typically if you're an OT, if you're a psychologist first, you can't then refer to yourself for life coaching or vice versa. So I wanted to ask you from your point of view, even though that's not how you operating, what advice would you give to somebody who wants to be both an OT or a physio or a psychologist, or whatever, and offer some additional a modality outside of the profession and operate that as something else? What, what, what tips would you give in terms of just making sure that they are legally compliant, that they're not overstepping boundaries and just creating that um, boundary for themselves? I think you need to be very clean and very clear on what is a patient and what is a client. And when you enroll someone into your therapy as a patient, then you will not be doing life coaching with that person for the duration of that offer or commitment or or package that you sold. So if a client, a patient comes in and you say, listen, we're going to work together for 12 weeks on dealing with your acute anxiety or your return to work or whatever, then keep it clean, keep it OT. And that then can be chargeable from your um, medical aids. You have a different contract that's specific for a patient and you have to ha be very clear. On the other hand, if you think that this person has come through their acute phase and now you feel that the most appropriate course of action would be life coaching, then that is a different discussion, a different agreement with a different contract. And you need to be very clean and clear as to what is it that you're offering at this point. Now, it is true that in our acute phase, we do life skills and some of the skills that you use in life coaching might be appropriate skills that you're going to teach your patient. But you in your head have to be very clean and very clear. And there has to be two different set of rules, two contracts, two different ways of charging that does not integrate and become sort of meshed together. And for me, the best way would be for you to spend a lot of time just writing out and preparing on, in your opinion, what is the definition of a patient? What is the criteria of a patient? Where is a, a, a human being still at when they're in the patient phase? It, there's, there's less of... Um, a concern when a person is ready for life coaching. And in that, I maybe make a recommendation for a grab roll in the shower. Mm. Or I make a recommendation for a certain um, a time management tool or emotional regulation tool that is maybe more purely a, a, a treatment because the person is already stable and healthy and you can package it in a way that is um, 
appropriate. The risk mm. comes when a person is actually more in the acute phase. They are actually a patient and you're going to treat them sometimes as a patient and sometimes as a client for life coaching. I think you're going to, you're going to get into trouble there. So would you, would you recommend rather that you, you can be both, but when you with one particular patient, if you, if you are seeing somebody in the acute stage, when they're ready to life coach, to rather refer to an, another life coach or vice versa, that if they're alive, no, I, you I think a person can be both. I just think the proceed, there has to be a very clean criteria for when okay. does a patient actually meet the criteria of life coaching. And I think there needs to be a very clear pause and stop to the one part with an opportunity to consult with a client from a new perspective so that they're very clear on what is about to happen going forward. And for you to be make sure the client is very clear on that they're no, now no longer a patient and they're now. So I think it's doable. And I think there's definitely scope for it. I'm coaching a couple of people through that process. And what I'm encouraged, encouraging them is for themselves, they have to be very clear what is the difference? What is mm. the criteria? So the intake interview in the beginning needs to be repeated to make sure that the client, let's say 12 weeks later or a year later, actually meets the criteria. And the client then needs to understand from a financial perspective, this is not chargeable from medical aids. Mm. This is for your own account, what we're doing here. And some human beings will transition easier and there must mm. be a point where you decide that this person, that I'm not the right person to life coach this, this particular human. There yeah. must be a place where you're willing to say no. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I think this was so fascinating. I think people will find it really, really interesting. So Tal, before we end off, maybe can you tell us a little bit about if there's anybody who's watching this who wants to you know, get coaching from you or see if that's something that they can benefit from, how do they reach you, all of that good stuff. Okay, so the easiest way is to go onto my website at www.audrigeyer.com and I have an opportunity and invitation there to book a 60-minute consultation with me that is free. And the opportunity really is to have this discussion, what exactly is your needs Am I the right person to provide in that need? What is the results that I can give you? And for us to just, this, I call it a discovery call, to just see who you are, who I am, and whether we are a match to work forward. And that's often the, the easiest way and the best, the most effective way to just make contact with me and establish the, the, the path ahead. There's an easy calendar on there, so you can just... Um, open it up and see when you're available and book yourself into my diary. And then we're going to come on a Zoom call and have that 60 minute discussion. What I would say is even in that discussion, my aim is to add a lot of value. I already want to give tools. I already want the person to come away from that 60 minutes feeling that I've coached them that they can use something, even if they don't coach with me after that, 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 that they received value from that 60 minutes already amazing and of course i will put all of that details in the description box below the video links to your social media um anything that you um, where people can find you and really just maybe if they want to stalk you a little bit first they yes. can do that amazing yes <laughs> so uh, but thank you so much for your time it's been amazing i wish you all the best with your life coaching business <laughs>